So for our audience, I mean, obviously, everyone is familiar with, as you mentioned, ABC and GC, but we know this is much more complex, both at the molecular typing of the tumor cells, but also the microenvironment that plays a factor in then describing different subsets. So I'd like Nathan maybe tell me what you're thinking, if you can tell our audience, um, after Craig sort of a, went on an overview, the fact that the signatures is getting more and more complex, what in 2020 we need to actually look at when we see a patient to make sure that we customize the therapy because that's the goal. So the bad news is, at least in 2020, we don't really have a good way to prognosticate these type of tumors. Uh, as, as Greg mentioned, you know, a lot of the studies are using next-gen sequencing. I think many of us, uh, even in academic centers, outside of maybe checking for MYC and BCL2, maybe, maybe BCL6, many people mm -hmm. are not getting kind of the level of sequencing that are gonna be required to separate patients in these different subgroups. You know, there are several groups uh, looking at other ways to potentially prognosticate patients, looking at RNA-seq, looking at some other profiles of these large cell lymphomas at diagnosis. But the unfortunate truth is that in 2020, I, I really don't see, outside of maybe double hit, which I think we're gonna talk about, uh, I don't see that most of us are really stratifying patients into different treatments based upon their uh, molecular portrait, at least, at least yet. I, I would say that I think that still a, looking at ABCGC in the routine is not done probably enough. It matters because when we look at patients who have ABC in a very high CAC7, very often they're going to be a double expressure, mm -hmm. with, a double expressure that we'll talk in a minute. And I think that um, a, a, for our audience, uh, you're right, we don't have a clear clear understanding of what's the minimum testing, but I think it's important that we go beyond just calling it large cell lymphoma and yeah. definitely have at least a KX7 and ABCGC. I think P53 is underestimated probably as yeah. well. EBV in elderly population. But if you see a patient coming as a lymphoma expert, you see someone coming, I mean, they have a diagnosis, Peter, of large cell lymphoma, and uh, they had just a diagnosis of large cell lymphoma. So what routinely at Cornell, at your institution, you would request to try to customize your treatment. Right. I think um, Nathan's point is a, is a good one in that uh, in this era, it's hard to necessarily um, modify therapies based on some of the data that we've looked at coming out, like molecular signatures. Um, nonetheless, uh, routinely our pathologists, uh, according who follow the World Health Organization book, will report uh, cell of origin based on immunohistochemistry, which is GC, non-GC. Uh, it's different than the original gene expression profiling. We routinely also do immunohistochemistry for MYC and BCL2, uh, which, as you mentioned, are more commonly expressed in the ABC subtype. Again, we do not uh, necessarily right now modify therapy based on that information, but BCL2 expression will be eligibility for an upcoming uh, national cooperative group trial that will look at the addition of venetoclax to standard therapies. And so, I think it's worthwhile for all of us to start incorporating that into standard pathology reports, um, partly because it's eligibility for a national trial, but also because if that trial is positive, then we will need to be able to do that. And then uh, FISH testing as well uh, for MYC and BCL2. Uh, interesting, I was, I was at a meeting recently, and it's clear that every institution is doing it, but we're not all doing it routinely in all of the same uh, patients, we know that it's more common, for example, in the germinal center subtype. Uh, it's probably more cost effective to only do it in that uh, group. Um, of course, if you do that, we'll miss some of them in a, a non-GC subtype. So, uh, for our audience, I think, uh, particularly at Ash this year, there's a few abstracts looking at the next level of complexity, if we can call it, and there's clearly more than four or six different entities. And then, as, um, as Craig mentioned, as we move forward, we'll be able to hopefully um, define a meaningful small signature that we're gonna use in the practice. Talking about practice, we should have, talk about other prognostic markers that we take into consideration when we see a newly patient, newly diagnosed uh, large cell lymphoma. So, um, <clears throat> uh, Dr. Chavez, can you mention about your prognostic factors, talking about the IPI or the NCCN IPI or Rivas IPI, what's your experience and what's your recommendation? Yeah, I, I think these uh, score assessments are very important to kind of uh, stratify patient and actually to kind of explain uh, patients the prognosis to the therapy that they will receive, you know, because this is a common question in the clinic, like how long are going to be in remission or is this going to cure me? So, you know, the IPI, the NCCN IPI, they're also use, useful tools 
uh, to determine the, you know, the overall survival and progression free survival of patients. So they're informative and they're easy to do. They're, you know, this is it's done in a clinic routinely, and uh, you know you can you can do that in front of the patient once you have all the information. So. Uh, but I agree, you know, additional information like uh, immunohistochemistry, knowing the GCV, no GCV, will give prognostic information to the patient as well as the fish status, which actually will help us determine the treatment. But the IPI, I mean, does not really help us decide on the type of treatment. You can have a low risk IPI and have a bad biology, right? And um, Greg, you guys at Mayo worked on the um, EFS 24, and then this is an interesting also, you want to mention. Um, the next um, prognostic model for our audience? Yes, uh, so EFS24 is a very important uh, prognostic mo model for overall survival. Uh, what we had seen that patients who are relapsing within the first uh, 24 months have um, a significantly shorter overall survival as you would expect. What's interesting about it is that patients uh, who are surviving without disease beyond 24 months have actually uh, well, overall survival which is close to normal population. So that's very reassuring for our patient. I mean, there's a model that you have defined that kind of predicted as EFS24, but doesn't necessarily help us. We'll go deeper into this in a minute on how to customize the treatment, because we know that large cell lymphoma typically does well with our chart, but the failures occur early, and 80% of the failures occur the first 18 months, and those patients are very challenging, even, um, even with a heart yeah. transplant. Yeah. 